All right. Good evening, everybody. It's Steve with Real Progressives. We're doing a special show tonight with Ellis. Uh, we were unable to pull off Ellis on Sunday night, so we're going ahead and pulling it off on Tuesday night. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to everyone uh, to thank them for uh, supporting us while I was in Washington, D.C. at the Millions for Medicare March. Um, wasn't a huge turnout simply because the weather was horrific. Had to get canceled before Nina Turner and John Conyers were able to go live, but we did get Ro Khanna and Dr. Margaret Flowers, uh, Eden, and several other folks that were on there. So it was a great time. Um, hopefully, if you heard my part of it, you got to hear a message of hope. You got to hear a message that was customized for people who are – um, you know, actually fighting for something, not fighting constantly against truth. Um, hopefully it was worthwhile for you to watch. Um, but without further ado, we had a show the other night that Ellis and I took great interest in that I did uh, because there was a gentleman in there that thought he knew everything there was to know about economics because he had read a textbook. He had read a textbook and knew everything there was to know, folks. And so we thought we'd do a special show to celebrate his knowledge. So without further ado, let me bring on Sir Ellis. Ellis, welcome on, sir. How are you tonight? How are you doing, Stephen? I am doing well. Mm. Uh, positive note here before we get into some of the Funyuns, uh, Lee Camp, for the first time that I've ever seen anyway. Now, he may have done it in some other secretive time or some other time that I didn't see, but Lee Camp actually retweeted a Stephanie Kelton tweet today, which is very, very promising considering he's long since been a zeitgeister. Uh, to see him retweet Stephanie uh, gave me a little shot of hope um, because, quite frankly, zeitgeist is a fool's game. Um but in any event, let's talk about this guy real quick, Alice. I mean, first of all, set the stage for your uh, for your contention, and I'll bring his comments up here momentarily. Uh, well, uh, for those people who aren't part of the profession, <laughs> I'll explain it this way. Um, the orthodoxy, when we say orthodoxy, we mean mainstream economics. And the orthodoxy currently is New Keynesian theory. And the Keynesian theory is a synthesis <laughs> of neoclassical theory and Keynes. And the problem is it's got nothing to do with Keynes. It's <laughs> New, Keynesian is, New Keynesian theory is just an appeal to authority. That's the way I like to say it. it. It's just using the name of Keynes to give it some kind of weight. And... In reality, it's just a bunch of neoclassical hogwash. And uh, your basic undergraduate textbooks, you know, you know, freshman, sophomore year, junior, senior year, <laughs> economics textbooks and materials are all orthodox. And basically, <clears throat> how should one put it? But bluntly, it's all fantasy. It's complete fantasy. It's junk. And so, yes, I'm telling you, that if you took out student loans <laughs> and you paid the tuition for an economics course in undergraduate studies and you paid for the textbook, you were ripped off. <laughs> it's that simple. I'm sorry, but, you know, you know, sitting there and telling me, that, oh, well, you mean the economics we learned in college, that uh, uh, is all wrong? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I, I hardly... Uh, believe that a college would de would fraud would, would you know defraud the, the student like that that's kind of like saying that no business has ever created a shitty product and sold it as a bar of gold before <laughs> you know um on on the whole you know other disciplines like physics and whatnot they're pretty right on you know they're trustworthy but when it comes to economics no there's not there's not an not a single bit of reality connected to undergraduate studies. 
So I, I want to go ahead and take this moment to read some of the gibberish from our friend Jeremy. So Jeremy started off, and there were so many comments that I'm going to just go to this one particular thread where he tried to hold court. He tried to act like a mensch. In reality, it was kind of funny, and people had a good time toying with him. But, but there's a lesson to be learned here, which is why we're doing this, it's not to embarrass him, although his behavior was deplorable. Um, he thought he was really schooling everybody, telling everybody how stupid we were and dumb we were. So here's what Jeremy said. He started out, you can't debunk something I can fucking prove, P-R-O-O-V-E. You spoke, but ignore So after he gets a little bit of a bludgeoning, he comes back, Steve, or whatever your name, I absolutely spelled A-B-S-O-L-U-T-L-Y, can prove it. I have made videos and do prove it. I'm not some nut job either like you were saying. I would have to write a lot to paint the whole picture for you, but I can lay it out and absolutely, minus the E, prove it. Show how the Fed works, which is written in college textbook, and then just use rational thinking and applying critical thinking. They are increasing our money supply, which extracts our labor, but also allows us to extract from the world. And then he says, I agree with your words about a movement. You are missing a huge part of the problem, though. Dude, I've been making videos and spreading awareness for over a year now. We are, oh, I can't even read that. You want to ridicule stupid spelling, who cares, has nothing to do with understanding how the banking system works. I don't have a college degree, just someone who did go for a little bit. More importantly, though, I've been looking for truth for 10 years now. I am calm, but you are wrong. When he is saying that people who talk about the banks are hurting the movement, I especially get upset, is actually quite the opposite. Okay, so look, we have a fractional reserve banking system. What that means is the banks have to keep a certain amount of reserve at their banks. The Fed determines this rate right now. It's 10% and has been for a while. The rest of the money can be loaned out, invested or whatever. Let's start there. Let's just go there. This, this is his, his uh, fait accompli. This is his thing here, man. So bottom line, talk about the fractional reserve and 10% and all that other good stuff. It doesn't exist. All right. <clears throat> Here's the thing. Fractional reserve banking, as they want to call it, effectively ended in the 1930s, if, if you, know, you want to be realistic. Um, second of all, uh, the people who talk about the fractional reserve lending system, people like you know, uh, AMI, for instance, they say that this is what allows banks to create money out of thin air. Huh. Okay. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is banks do uh, create money, all right? Um, but it's not the 10% reserve requirement that allows them to accomplish this. There's nothing to do with it. For instance, Canada, Australia, they don't have a reserve requirement. So under that logic, that would mean that Canadian banks and Australian banks can't create money. <laughs> so there's the fatal logic there. Now, um, the Bank of England did release a paper a couple of years ago that debunked loanable funds theory. And loanable funds theory is a typical college textbook feature. All right. And it says that banks are intermediaries and they bring savers and investors together and no such thing exists. <laughs> all right. Yet, you know, college students learn all about this. And along with that, they learn about the money multiplier. I uh, and, and the money multiplier, believe it or not, it starts out very simple as far as an equation goes, but it can become pretty vast. <laughs> all right. It's to take up a lot of students time, you know, for no reason, because the money multiplier is a myth. It doesn't exist either. Okay. It just doesn't exist. 
Um, I, I, I tend to call it the, oh, my God, we're all going to die equation. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is banks do create money, but it operates on a money. It operates on a credit creation model. This is credit money. Uh, and a bank, when it lends, what it has to do is it creates a deposit. Literally, it just goes to a keyboard, types, you know, numbers, creates an account with a deposit. There it is. So loans actually create deposits, all right? And a bank will seek reserves if it needs them after the fact, all right? And the reason why this, this gentleman is completely wrong is because he doesn't understand who owns the unit of account. The unit of account is the thing that government owns. All right. The unit of account in the U.S. is called the U.S. dollar. In Australia, it's the Australian dollar. In Japan, it's the Japanese yen. In the U.K., it's the pound sterling. Okay, The government owns the unit of account. And banks, they issue their own type of money, if you want to call it that, which is just an IOU. All right, But no one would really want the bank's IOU because, you know, if you get it from Chase, it's nothing more than a chase book. If you get it from Bank America, it's a Bank America book. Nobody really wants that because when you go to Walmart to buy some groceries, for instance, things aren't priced in chase books, okay? <laughs> They're not priced in Bank of America books. They're priced in U.S. dollars. All right. So in order to get the bank's IOU to be widely accepted, it has to do something. It has to actually denominate its IOU in the unit of account, and the unit of account belongs to the government. And when it does this, um, it effectively behaves like a dollar because it can become widely accepted because it ch exchanges on par with the dollar. So a Bank America book and a, and a uh, Chase book will clear on par with one U.S. dollar. Okay? And it also makes it acceptable to extinguish tax liabilities. That doesn't mean that the government actually uses bank money to settle a tax liability but you can pay your taxes with it. So if you got bank money, you went out and got a loan for $5,000 to pay your taxes, you can pay your taxes, all right? But the treasury, when it when it goes to uh, settle the tax liability, yes, bank the bank, the loan will drop, the deposit will drop $5,000. But high-powered money, which sits in the bank's reserve account, will also drop by $5,000, and that high-powered money, or what we call HPM, is what the government uses to settle those tax liabilities because HPM is government money and commercial banks cannot issue HPM. So that uh, sort of uh, puts that correct. <laughs> All right, banks do create money, but they actually only leverage the government's high powered money by taking an asset position to try and earn a profit. You know, that's how they profit. They don't actually create money and government says, oh, please give me some money. I'm broke. And banks says, well, hold on a minute. Can we <laughs> talk about what money is? Define money. Because, no, there's, money because it's vague. And there's money. It's vague. It is, money can be, <laughs> you know, money is just a vague term. We can talk about monetary instruments. You know, what makes a monetary instrument? And there we can get precise. There are at least three things that you need to have a monetary instrument. All right. One. You have to have an issuer, okay? This means that monetary instruments are man-made things, okay? So you have to have an, ish an issuer. It has to have a face value, and the issuer has to promise to accept it back as payment for something. Like in the case of the government, it accepts the dollar back to pay your taxes, you know, to settle a tax liability, all right? So a monetary instrument is a man-made thing that has a face value. And at the top of the hierarchy is government money, which is called high-powered money, the U.S. dollar in the United States. And beneath that are bank loans, you know, bank IOUs, bank money, right? Bank money, that's beneath that. And it goes all the way down to, like, little coupons for Tide, <laughs> you know, and coupons for grocery stores for 50 cents off uh, a, 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 a pound of ham, <laughs> okay? But the most widely accepted monetary instrument in the United States happens to be the government's U.S. dollar, not bank IOUs. Bank IOUs are just pegged to the dollar. So, 
Like when you go out and ask for a loan from Chase and Chase gives you that loan, uh, say like a $5,000 loan, what it's betting on you doing is spending that deposit, all right? which is what you do. And when you do, you're actually demanding government money. So it pegs it to the dollar, and then the bank has to stand ready to exchange its IOU for an actual U.S. dollar, okay? <laughs> so deposits, okay, loans create deposits, okay? And the reserves, which are central bank liabilities, those are dealt with after the fact if the bank needs to. There's, there's no such place, in the, there's, there's no such thing, excuse me, as a bank giving you a loan, but before it does, it says, quick, check and see if we have enough reserves to lend. They don't do that. They lend. Someone else deals with the reserves after the fact. Okay. So. All right. So let's go ahead and read a little bit more of our friend Jeremy here. Mm -hmm. Jeremy was not too short with words. They weren't always spelled correctly, but damn it, if he didn't have things to say. So. After he got through that, then he came back and he goes, so let's say Joe puts 100 in the bank. The bank only has to keep 10 of it and loans out the rest. You already just debunked that. Can't. Loanable funds theory is dead. And the reason why it's dead is because it's a classroom gadget. It may appear in a college textbook, but I refuse to teach it. Okay. The only way that I would teach it as total fantasy and as a classroom gadget is that this is what New Keynesians believe. This is what the orthodoxy believes. And I'm telling you now, everybody who's listening, it's very important for you to understand this. Loanable funds theory is the way New Keynesians want banking to operate. It's not how it operates, it's how they want it to, and they sell it as reality to maintain their position of influence as the orthodoxy, okay? It's just that simple. Loanable funds does not exist. Banks lend on the credit creation model. I, I, I can't stress this enough. So for those of you who are new to MMT, please understand. <laughs> Banks cannot and simply do not lend out reserves because reserves are central bank liabilities that, are, that operate the payment system. You can't lend out the payment system, <laughs> okay? You just can't do that. If, if you go and swipe a debit card at Walmart to buy something, the reserves in your bank's reserve account at the Fed will shift over to Walmart's bank's reserve account at the Fed. Okay, That's what settles the payment. That's what settles the transaction. If banks lent out the reserves, they'd be lending out the payment system and your payment wouldn't go through. And the central bank would have to constantly be intervening to add more reserves. It doesn't work that way. All right. Banks just don't lend out reserves. There's no loanable funds theory is dead. Okay, dead. End of story. BOE issued a paper, demonstrated conclusively that it was hogwash, and then they even issued a, a little PDF there for the average person in the general public to understand uh, credit creation. All right. <laughs> so even the BOE admits credit creation is how banks lend. They don't lend out reserves. All right. So here's his next thing. This is getting into supply and demand and the value of the dollar and inflation. So he's like, if you've ever learned about supply and demand, that is what determines the price of things. They both have different things that affect That's them true. and determines them. One of those things that determines demand is the amount of money available to people. The more money people have to spend, the more it will increase demand and then increase the price. So by creating money out of thin air, this jacks up prices on houses, cars, colleges, etc. I can hear Milton Friedman talking from the grave there. Right, through. he's possessed by Milton Friedman's ghost, and we've already talked about that. Did you have a? You had someone else? Was it uh, John Harvey on that discussed Friedman's quantity theory of money at one time? Yeah. John Harvey. Hard? Yeah, and I've discussed it before. The little <laughs> m times b equals p times q bullshit. <laughs> where there's nothing wrong with the equation except the way Friedman modified the variables so they would be constant so that if the money supply increased, the only thing else that could increase is the price level. That's horrendous nonsense. Okay. It's, it's just absolute nonsense. It's not, it's not even an accurate portrayal of reality. It's nowhere near it. All right. 
And the reason why is the velocity of money in the private sector is not constant whatsoever. As a matter of fact, Friedman and his little uh, friend, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, they tried to fudge numbers to make it look like the velocity of money was constant. Little outright fraud, okay? <laughs> and uh, they also like us to believe Q, the variable Q, which is output or full employment. They want us to believe that we're always in a state of full employment. So the only thing that can go up if the money supply goes up is the price level. So there he is. He's talking about if more money enters the economy, the prices automatically go up. What he's not thinking about is what, you know, is simple. Firstly, if there is any, if there are any idle resources available, this means if there is unemployment, if unemployment exists, if there are people who are willing and able to work but cannot find a job, or there are people who are underemployed, meaning they're working part-time and they prefer to have more work, they would like more work, as long as this exists, and as long as the production infrastructure is sound, where you can increase output, then inflation will not occur if the U.S. government increases the amount of dollars in circulation until you reach the point of macroeconomic efficiency, which is full, absolute full employment. That's where anyone and everyone who wants a job can find one, okay? That's full employment, not what they call full employment today. True full employment is when there are more jobs available than workers to do those jobs, okay? It's, it's as simple as that. All right, and he said something else that I want to point out, and I kind of forgot here. What was it you read at the beginning? Could you read that back again? Oh, so it's very see. important. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, very beginning. Uh, shoot, I think I lost. I'm sorry, I did this too. <laughs> That's all right, because you can't you yeah. can't debunk something I can fucking prove. You spoke. Unity, but ignore truth. No, not that. The, the, the first part about the uh, supply and demand thing. We have supply and demand, and that determines price. That's right. No, it doesn't determine the price. The government is the price setter. All right? And I think we need to clarify this right away. All right? The government, the currency-issuing national government, in this case the U.S. government, the U.K. government, the Canadian government, the Japanese government, the Australian government, is the price setter. All right? And how it works is simple. The government lays a tax on the market, and it is payable only in the government's unit of account. So in the U.S., it's only payable in U.S. dollars, all right? And it declares a punishment as well with this tax if you don't pay it. So the market is forced, and entities, private sector entities are forced to pay this tax, and they're forced to obtain U.S. dollars. But the only way to do that is to sell their goods and services to the U.S. government in exchange for the government's dollar. All right. So the market moves forward to the government and offers up its goods and services. And the government decides because it is the monopoly issuer of the dollar, which means that it is the only supplier of the dollar and is the only place you can get the dollar. The government itself determines the price it is willing to pay for a good or a service in U.S. dollars because it alone issues the dollar. It gets to choose because it's the monopoly issuer. So it has monopolistic power to choose the price. And when it does choose the price, it then pays because the private sector needs the dollar to pay the tax. So it pays for the goods by manufacturing its own currency by spending dollars into existence to buy it at the price it has determined it will pay, all right? So the government is the price setter. To give you a perfect example of this, let us explore universal healthcare for a second and EpiPen, all right? EpiPen is selling for a ridiculous price right now. If the government were to have universal healthcare, let's say, and the government popped in there and said, we're, re we're ready to buy EpiPen, and EpiPen, the maker of EpiPen, came up there and said, hey, uh, $800 a piece. The government can offer a take it or leave it price, not because it's a universal health care scheme, but just because that's the government's, that's the government's uh, price setting power. It will say, I will pay $8 for an EpiPen and no more. You either take it or you leave it. 
Now, if the maker of EpiPen chooses to leave it, then the maker of EpiPen can't do business in the U.S. Okay, so with labor, it's the same thing. The government can simply open up a federal job guarantee employing anyone who's willing and able to work and pay a fixed minimum wage. Whatever it determines that minimum wage will be, that will become the national minimum wage. In other words, that will become the base price of labor, the bottom floor price of labor. Government has determined the price of labor. Government is the price setter, not the market. If the market prices are prevailing, as they like to say it, it's simply because the government chooses to pay that price. At no time is the government forced to pay market prices. It can pay whatever the hell it wants for a hammer. It can pay whatever the hell it wants for a cheeseburger. It can pay whatever the hell it wants for an iPhone. So if the federal government only paid $15 for a DeLonghi coffee maker, why would you want to pay any more? Hmm? Okay, so there it is. Government is the price setter, end of story. So Jeremy goes on and goes, create our credit creation. Are you trying to confuse people on purpose? It's creating money out of thin air. Secondly, yeah, it's all backed by our tax dollars, but the Fed is who sets these rates and they do not answer to our government. Yep, just see your other responses. You're lying about supply and demand and trying to deceive and not look for truth. I'll whip out the damn book and show you. Oh, but the book is wrong? Laugh my ass off. I can see where this is going. You lying, me getting angry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's his point? That uh, credit creation is, what, well, bank lending comes out of thin air? I think we already talked about banks peg the dollar, peg their bank, peg, peg their IOUs to the dollar. Makes it acceptable to clear tax liabilities, therefore it becomes widely accepted. La la la. <laughs> Credit creation model. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, he's going to whip out a textbook. Go. Oh. Yeah. So here's the next piece. He says, "Money is a means of exchange. If it would no. stay constant, no. it works perfectly. If no. the supply is constantly increased, it allows people to extract." The labor from the rest of the population, no. but also is the tr is the true causes of our severe ups and downs. Also, the real reason we almost collapsed. They are still doing it, and this time the bubble is okay. the stock market. Okay, here this this is the uh, shall, can I can I can I be blunt here, Steve? Yes. Okay. This is the typical ramblings and the rantings. Uh, it's gibberish that I that I and others hear from your typical undergraduate that's taken a few college courses and has been uh, indoctrinated with anti knowledge. All right, this is this is typical. I mean, I've heard these arguments over the years millions of times from different people. And here's the truth: he thinks that money is everything. So he reminds me of Paul Krugman. All right. There's also real resources, and they were there before money were created. Money is a man, monetary instruments are a man made thing. Okay? It's a number, <laughs> all right? And that's it. All right? It's a man made creation. But iron ore is not a man made creation. Hydrogen is not a man made creation. Food, well, I guess men can make food, <laughs> process nasty food, but uh, and call it food, I think soil it green, you know? Um, but for the most part, vegetation, fish, wildlife, everything that exists on planet Earth exists by nature, okay? All these real resources. And man uses those real resources to affect production to produce goods and services, all right? Money. And he's talking about the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is nothing more than a tax credit that people happen to use to buy goods and services and affect production. And the reason why is because they're forced to pay taxes with it. 
That's what you have to use to extinguish your tax liability. So dollars of tax credit. So what do you do with any dollars you have left over after you pay the tax? Well, you can save them or you can spend them. And people are willing to exchange their tin of baked beans or their fur coats or their Ferraris, right, for U.S. dollars because they need to pay the tax too. That's why everything is priced in U.S. dollars. It's just a ticket to watch the show that government creates out of thin air, as they like to say, but it's not thin air. It's deliberately done when Congress sets a budget. They decide on what they want to buy, and then they manufacture the dollars necessary to buy it. <laughs> All right. Now, so the real problem and the real issue is the real resources. The U.S. has vast real resources. It's a very wealthy nation, not because it has lots of money, because the money is infinite. The real resources, which are finite, the U.S. has more than its fair share. Okay? When you're talking about geographical space, the entire Earth, and man divides up little sections of the Earth with arbitrary borders and says, this is mine and that's yours. The real resources in between those, inside those borders are what the nation has to work with. And if you're the Sudan, you're kind of fucked. But if you're the United States, you got a long way to go before you die of inflation. So what happens is when the government begins deficit spending, which means it's adding more dollars to the economy, all right, this increases aggregate demand. Aggregate demand. Not in aggregate demand. Huh? I said we well, demand aggregate demand. Yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Shit, we need aggregate demand. They're killing it. But it, it increases aggregate demand, which means that business receives increased pressure from consumers to increase its production. And to do that, it needs to hire people, but it also needs the real re resources available. And if both these things exist and the unemployment rate is high or even low, there's room to maneuver, all right? So when that aggregate demand comes up against unemployment, and real resources that are available to increase production, what happens is business will increase its output rather than mark up the price. When deficit spending comes up against the barrier of macroeconomic efficiency, which means when there's no more labor that can be found to increase production or no more real resources exist that can increase output, then that spending has reached the barrier and can go no further. If it goes further, persistently further, you will get demand pull inflationary pressure starting to rise. To what's this kid's name? Jeremy, is it? Yes. Okay. To uh, allay Jeremy's fears, I am 50 years old and there never has been a demand pull inflationary episode in the US since I've been alive. <laughs> So <laughs> Jeremy, so let, let's let's keep going with Jeremy's stuff here. He, here's here's my I I did one earlier today that I am flaming, I, and I might actually interject after we get through this one. He says, more importantly, the dollar being the world reserve currency oh. and the U.S. creating money out of thin air is allowing USA to extract from the world, and is why we have so much power. He's not aware that Bretton Woods is over. We're not in a fixed exchange regime here. And uh, <laughs> the reason why uh, foreign entities, like foreign, foreign firms, the reason why they sell their production to the U.S. is because they wish to save in U.S. dollars. So when Jeremy goes to Walmart and buys a bag of, of, of Chinese rice, okay, a Chinese company is paid in U.S. dollars because he gives them the U.S. dollars for that, and then the Chinese company saves those U.S. dollars. It buys bonds. All right, it sticks them in a savings account where they sit and earn interest. Uh, the 70s hyperinflation was an OPEC oil thing, and it was called a cost-push scenario. Okay, it's a cost-push scenario. Uh, that means it's a supply problem, all right, not a demand problem. Not from printing money. Right. <laughs> Even though we don't print money, but what? Well, I know, but I just got to speak the language of the people, Ellis. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. So real quickly, mm-hmm. so I want to talk about the, the whole world reserve currency thing for a second. Yes, because we're all going to die. <laughs> the, the, Japanese, the Japanese yen is a world reserve currency. The UK is a world reserve currency. The Eurozone Euro is a uh, world reserve currency. The, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, The Chinese uh, Yuan is now a world reserve currency as well. So with that in mind, which of those other countries that has a world reserve currency is an empire? Which one of them... Uh, is running the world by fist and decree and dropping bombs everywhere to maintain empire that makes their reserve currency somehow or another uh, so threatened that they are going to, the world's going to come to an end and they're going to die. Which one of them? Not one of them. Okay. And more importantly, Japan spends 700 billion a year in new money every year as a 250% debt to GDP ratio. And and that, they- that's that debt, to, that, debt, that debt to GDP ratio is absolutely a, it's pointless. It's not. Well, as it, I mean, you've got stocks on one hand and you've got flows on the other. I mean, we can't, you, you can't conflate these two things, all right? But this if, is the stuff they say. This is the stuff they say. And I'm waiting. Why is it that Japan has a 250% debt to GDP ratio and they can't touch 2%? And inflation. Why is that? It literally makes me want to literally strangulate. I really want to snap. When is Japan? Japan is not an empire. They are not stuck to the petrodollar. They're a little teeny island nation. Okay. That has 250% debt to GDP. They are. They are are a trading and economic powerhouse, though. Absolutely. Okay, very modern, but uh, at the same time, <laughs> the government issues the yen. It creates it out of thin air, not banks. And to this moment, people say, oh, you know, Japan's going to fall into the sea any day now. And they've been saying any day now for the last 40 years. <laughs> well, actually, for the last 30 years. Japan's going to die. They're the walking dead. <laughs> it's going to sink into the sea. And it never happens. And there's a good reason for that. Because the government controls the currency, <laughs> it's, it's it's highly offensive, Ellis, to, to to see people in our movement that have access to quality information that repeat this ad nauseum over and over and over again. Though, right? I mean, this literally it, it, in my speech in D.C., I talked about hope and I talked about thinking big. And as long as these people continue to think small ball, continue to look at doom and gloom, continue to lie. I mean, lie, lie. We're not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We're talking about an honest to God, bona fide lie. You know, they literally are sidelining a movement. And and it's up to us to overcome that, blow through that, and and, and have enough people out there that actually understand this so we can put pressure on Congress regardless of whether our election system is rigged, failed, or flawed, the power of the people will not be denied when we unite and we push and we force this to happen. I I just wanted to say it because how the hell, why do they keep saying, well, if the U.S. isn't a reserve currency anymore? That's nothing to do with anything. It it, it is preposterous, the, the, the level of derp, the son of derp level of logic that goes into this is appalling, but it is... I'm talking about people that are in this movement that have large audiences that are saying horrible, horrible lies and misdeeds. Instead of being a student, they just have to say things and I don't get it. Don't get it. Don't get it. Let, it, let, let me let me reiterate that in the 19, because they're talking about the inflation of the 1970s really quick. <clears throat> The inflationary scenario, the great inflation of the 70s, was not hyperinflation. That was an accelerating inflation episode. It was cost push, not demand pull. In other words, it means that there was a supply problem, not a money problem. It didn't mean that there was a spending problem where people were overspending. It means that there was a supply problem. Okay, And it was an accelerating episode that became stagflation. 
Okay, and it's because the government reacted to the cost push scenario in an inappropriate manner. All right, so that's that. And uh, fear is a liar. Yeah, uh, fear is bullshit. I'm, I'm telling you that right now. Fear is bullshit. When it comes to economics, fear is complete bullshit. It's peddling bullshit. There's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, if you want something to fear, fear the orthodoxy. Okay, fear Congress because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> All right? But as far as reality goes, the US government is a sovereign currency issuing government. So is the UK, so is Canada, so is Japan, so is Australia. All of these nations issue their own currency at will. All right, and it's not the banks, it's the government that does it. The governments own their own public debt. What that basically means is they're just savings accounts, okay, at the central bank. That's it. And uh, I think it's very important for people who are new here to understand how the government spends. How it spends is through direct, high-powered money creation. Right? In simple terms, for the layperson or the general public, the uninitiated, the government spends by creating its own dollars and then buying things. <laughs> See? <laughs> and, and, and when the government spends high-powered money, it creates it and then injects it into a reserve account. Okay, The central bank emits the HPM. It goes into a reserve account, and it stays in reserve accounts at the Federal Reserve going back and forth, or the central bank just going back and forth, clearing payments. And when tax time comes, the HPM is destroyed. And here's the reason why. Let's just use the U.S., but it's the same everywhere. It's the same in these other countries. We'll just talk about the U.S. The Treasury spends from an account that is not connected to the banking system, meaning it's not part of the banking system, it sits outside of the banking system. And everything in that account, every single dollar in that account is not part of the stock of money in the economy at all. It's not counted as stock because it's not. When the government spends through direct high-powered money creation and injects it into a reserve account, it then becomes money. It then becomes a dollar. Okay, it then is able to purchase things and it becomes part of the stock of money. So when government spends, high powered money, the level of high powered money in reserve accounts rises. And bank money, which is M1, in a checking account, M2 is a savings account. Okay, these are just measures. M1, M2 will rise depending on where the government deposit made the deposit. If Treasury credited a checking account, M1 will rise. If Treasury credited a savings account, M2 will rise, all right? When government taxes, though, and it uh, goes, the Treasury goes in there, into that individual account, what happens is it simply marks down the account and bank money is destroyed, so M1, M2 drops. But what's important is the high-powered money that sits in the reserve account. It leaves the banking system. The government actually deletes it from the reserve account, and it goes bye-bye. It leaves forever from the economy. And then the central bank, the Federal Reserve, then credits Treasury's account. It goes in there and raises Treasury's account. But remember, Treasury's account that it spends from and writes checks from is not part of the stock of money. So there is only one conclusion. When you pay your federal taxes, the dollars you use to do so are destroyed. It's physically and operationally impossible for the U.S. government to spend the proceeds from tax collections. So, is there something to fear? Fuck no. Okay. Well, you fear I Congress. If you, you fear Congress, who tells you that taxes are funding spending? All right. No, they're not. I have right. something that I fear, and I'm going to put it up here on the board here, real quickly. Um, I think this is actually really good. So this right here, I used this in my uh, in my uh, lesson at the Green Party. And this is very, very, very important right here. Mm -hmm. This right here, every time folks have tried to pay off the national debt, because this is always the pay it off or pay it down, pay it off, pay it down, whatever. Run a surplus. 
<laughs> well, there was one. There was one in 1823 to 1836 where they paid off. Andrew Jackson. <laughs> and right there, as soon as it happened, as soon as it was paid off, the uh, country went into a deep depression. I mean, each time, each time, each time we've tried. About a no die. <laughs> massive depressions and recessions each time. And yet, this is what the people demand, Ellis. The people demand, this is populism. The people demand we pay the debt down. The people demand we reduce the deficit. The people demand we chop our own heads off and shoot ourselves in the junk sack. I mean, this is the crazy nonsense that the people demand. You see, the reason why there's, there's been seven surpluses in U.S. history, you're looking at them on the screen right now, and after each of those seven, we've had seven economic downturns. And the reason for that is because federal deficit spending is the only way to add net financial assets to the non-government sector. In layperson speak, federal deficit spending adds more dollars to the private sector. Okay? It's the only way to add and leave more dollars in the private sector for people to hold on to. So if the government is running a surplus, what it's actually doing is it's withdrawing dollars from the private sector. And remember what we just said, what I just told you, when the government removes HPM from the banking system, it's destroyed. Okay? It's destroyed. Even if you, which it can't be done, but even if you took those tax dollars and you shifted that HPM directly to Treasury's account, <laughs> it just, which is not possible. It has to go, one has to go down and another goes up. It's all electronic. But even if you took a physical dollar and moved it over there, that dollar would no longer be part of the stock of money because the account from which the federal government spends sits outside the banking system as not part of the stock of money. So this is how it injects dollars. If you need more dollars to decrease the unemployment rate, Okay, if businesses is suffering lax demand because consumers can't afford to spend, sales are going to drop, business income is going to fall, and business is going to shed excess workers. And when they do, things are going to get worse and worse and worse till you get a recession. You need more dollars. The only way to do that is deficit spending. Okay, you got to leave them in people's hands so they can spend them. All right. And if people choose to take their dollars and stick them in a savings account and not spend them, then the government has to make up for that too because that's called a demand leakage. Any kind of saving where you're not spending a dollar is a demand leakage. And, in fact, the government actually encourages demand leakages. IRA is a perfect example. It actually encourages people through tax incentives to stick their money in savings and not touch it for like 20, 30, 40 years. So all it's basically saying, all the government is doing with IRAs, is it's encouraging people to create recession. <laughs> Stick your money in savings, don't spend it, cause business income to drop, unemployment to rise, and a recession to occur. Okay? That's what it's doing. All right? So if there's a demand leakage going on, the government has to make up for that. So what we say in MMT, in the MMT community, is that government has to meet the net savings desire of the private sector. Whatever the private sector wishes to net save, it has to meet that at all times, all right? It's real well, simple. I want, to, I want to show you, this This is one of my favorite tweets, Dr. Kelton. God book. bless Stephanie. And, God bless Stephanie. I love that. I love that you know, quote. <laughs> this is, you know, this is exactly what we need. I mean, this right here is precisely mm -hmm. what we need to understand here is, you know, repeal and replace establishment, a.k.a. orthodox economics. New Keynesian bullshit. We got it. <laughs> Astrology. Astrology Zero-sum austerity mindset. Hashtag MMT. Right. I mean, this I is... Would, I would say, the way I would put it in my own words, I would say abolish. Abolish. Yeah. Abolish it. Because it's... I, 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 there's no other way to explain it except to be very blunt. Orthodoxy, the orthodoxy, orthodox economics, okay, is astrology. 
That's it. In a, I'm telling you, it's literally the same as astrology. If you think it's a science, you're fooling yourself. If you think it's reality, you're way off base. Okay. These are imagine. These are the imaginations of men and women who are delusional. These are people who look at the economy and they say, "I want the economy to work this way." It doesn't matter how it actually works. They don't care about how the orthodoxy does not care about how the economy actually works. They describe it in terms as though uh, as they want to see it as they want it to work, as they wish it to be, and then just declare it to be reality. Okay? And that's it. It's all fantasy. DSGE is the equivalent of astrology. It's the equivalent of saying when Jupiter rises in Sagittarius, uh, unemployment, the unemployment rate, rate will drop. I mean, seriously. <laughs> it's really that much nonsense. It's just all nonsense. And your textbooks... Your textbooks are filled to the help from page one to the very index with this nonsense. That's it. It's make believe. Lord of the Rings. End of story. Right? Nothing Absolutely. to do with reality. Absolutely. So, so yeah, yeah, repeal and replace, abolish. Abolish. I want, I want to bring up another one here real quickly while we're while we're talking about these things. This right here, this one I'm about to show. This image right here is is precisely what I wish were true, but sadly, many in our progressive movement have fallen prey to the really horrific economics that we've talked about in the past. So whereas liberals are the, the old guard, the old left that is still marching in place, throwing identity politics out there, doing all kinds of nonsense that has nothing to do with actually advancing the ball to save lives, okay? Okay. The progressive community has opted to suckle into really horrific, horrific economic truths as well. So while we're sitting here fighting for Medicare for all, there's no such thing as helicopter money. We're, we're trying to um, actually get somewhere. We've got people, um, you know, that have gone out there on the air and have basically sent hundreds if not thousands of people chasing their own tail with nonsense. And, you know, I want to say this because while we're very, very much, um, you know, think about what it is that we want, you know, I don't think people really talk about these conspiracies. They talk about what it is that they want. They want single payer. They want free college. They want to eradicate student debt. They want green energy. They want paid family and medical leave. They like infrastructure. They like a job guarantee. Some fools are running around for this UBI thing. Bottom line is, is that ultimately they want all these things. But then on the same hand, they get handcuffed, brainlocked with this sidelining nonsense. And it completely and utterly renders them useless in fighting for any of the things that they just said. So after you whittle past the, the shared values that most of us have in terms of what we say we want, the this is why I have no patience for all the other flailing about that occurs in progressive alternative media. They're out there talking about these sideline issues when reality is, is at the end of the day, it all comes back down to the bare necessity of understanding economics, having enough confidence in that message, and then demanding that they serve us with or without this voting system fixed or elections fixed or any of the other shit. If we bonded together and we walked down to the freaking state house, we walked down to our town hall, we walked into Congress, we took over and we literally said, now we would have it. Problem is that people genuinely are like sidelined with this nonsense. So it's, uh, I saw Carla say something about a hey, don't be rate teach. And um, the, the reality is, is that you have to ask yourself, as much, and I do love Carla, by the way, she's one of my favorite people. The reality is there are people out there who literally refuse to read the links, who refuse to watch the videos and have run around one person, individual that is part of the larger alternative media went running around saying stuff about how he doesn't like MMT because he thinks it'll devalue the dollar across the world. So he thinks it's wrong. 
Now, mind you, he doesn't know anything about economics. He doesn't want to read, doesn't want to learn. He's just got ideas and he's got a platform. So he says these things and people listen to him because people are not discerning. They just go, oh, that's really cute. I like what he's, he's got really great hair. I really like him. And that's the extent of it. Yeah, and he's, he's got a little thing. He's got a little thing here. It's called the Orthodox Economics Translator. Okay. Yeah. And when he has some MMT, he just plugs it in and says, hey, uh, Orthodox Translator, uh, what about MMT? What's the danger? It will devalue the dollar worldwide. Thank you. Yeah. I don't like MMT because it will devalue the dollar worldwide. The reason why he's doing that is he's just plugging in, you know, a statement into his orthodox, you know, what he's what he heard on television or what he read in a in a newspaper or article. That's all. That's all he's doing. All right. And these people, I I ignore them because this is their inadequacy, not mine. I teach uh, MMT and. Uh, Mac and, and post Keynesian stock flow consistent modeling, you know, that's that's that. And I talk a lot about Koleski too. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, these people that want to go off on a tangent and, and cry in their soup, you know, be my guest, but I'm not eating your soup. I don't have time for this. And I'm not going to spoon feed you either. Eventually, you know, they come around, and if they don't, well, they'll be drug across the finish line. But there are so many people every day that want to hear more and more and more. It, there's no there's no point in dealing with people like that. So the point, the reason why I said, and I agreed to do this and talk about this uh, Jeremy guy's post is because what did I say, Steve? It would make a good learning opportunity for those who are interested in MMT and willing to learn. And that's why, that's why we're talking about it, is for a learning opportunity for those of you who are interested in learning. That's, that's right. That's right. So, Alice, you know, we go back and forth uh, with a lot of the things that that you and I want to discuss. And, you know, we talk about the fact that MMT equals hope. And and we see genuine hope. Genuine hope. Yeah. Not, not the kind of, well, I like to have hope. I mean, genuine hope. You know, when someone tells you there's a cure for AIDS and it's free, that's genuine hope for the AIDS sufferer, right? But when you say, well, there'll be a cure maybe within the next 20 years or even 15, that's sort of, well, there's hope. <laughs> no, I'm talking about genuine hope. <laughs> MMT is genuine hope. Or as they say in uh, the South, genuine. <laughs> okay. So I, I want to I touch on this a little bit because I think that it's important. So yesterday in D.C., uh, many of the speakers, other than myself, went up there and talked about how we could save money, we could save taxpayer money, we can save different things, this, that, and the other. And you know, in in uh, before I went up there on stage, I talked to Rokana off stage, and Rokana acknowledged that oh. Stephanie Kelton is right. Okay, now Rokana actually acknowledged that Stephanie Kelton was right off stage, so there is some hope there that he may be. The light bulbs may be going on. I'm still waiting. I told him I was going to still tweet at him and tell him, hey, don't forget about MMT, because when I start seeing him stray into orthodoxy, I'm going to yank him back because he's been exposed and he does know. OK, um, but there are many people out there who no matter what you say, hold on like for dear life that they've got to find dollars, that they've got to dig them up somewhere. They've got to cut something to find dollars. And, and they really don't understand the fact that, you know, they're like, well, where is that point that we have to stop spending? Where is that that spot? And then we say, well, it's up to the point of real resources. And you just talked a little bit ago about the gasoline being a, an issue of the amount of gas we had, not the amount of dollars. Yeah, and so actually, the amount of oil you know, and the price thereof, you know, they restrict it to get some little bit of a revenge. And the next thing you know, you have an inflationary problem because everything depends on oil. You know, transport. You need to get goods and services. Well, you need to make petrol. You need to make gasoline to get you know get the food to market. So forth. So ever the price of everything is going to rise because you have a supply problem now. That's why. So that like I like I was saying, the eight, this 1970s inflation was a supply issue, it was a cost push issue. 
it's not a, it wasn't a demand pull issue. Exactly. All right. So uh, le- last thing, you know, John McCain, uh, the guy who, uh, you know, has been ra- listed as a maverick. He's been listed as an independent thinker. He's been listed as all these things. The guy rushes out of the hospital, having been determined to have uh, cancer, uh, brain cancer, terminal cancer, aggressive cancer. And he's like, hey, I have, we, we put a meme up. It's like, I have a brain tumor that is being treated with a government-funded health care plan, but I just rushed to D.C. to vote against other people having the same access to treatment. And, you know, on one hand, I, I think to myself, you know, John McCain, screw you. Um, but sadly, there are many people who believe that he did the right thing, which is really sad. I mean, it's good that we're going after and trying to get rid of this garbage handout of you know, Medicare, um, excuse me, the ACA. But we don't even have a replacement and we cannot get even Democrats to sign on to Medicare for all, much less going to a true national health care service. I mean, talk a little bit about health care in, in the country, sir. <laughs> health care in the U.S. or the U.K.? Well, both, because they tie together in terms of one's got it, one doesn't. Yeah, the U.K. had a, a brilliant, you know, the NHS, the National Health Service. Um, it's government-run. It is a beautifully efficient organization. And it has saved many, many lives. Uh, I just recently posted a, a, a quote from Stephen Hawking as ALS. You know, everybody's familiar with him. Um, where he says he believes 100% in universal health care because he's been treated very, very well by British health care. And that's true of all people in Britain. The U.S. operates on a paradigm of nonsense where it prefers to have health insurance to health care. So up until now, which I've seen recently, <laughs> the uh, Democratic Party has been of the stance where it wants to convince its uh, following, its disciples, to go out into the streets and demand health insurance, not health care. <laughs> okay, I understand that that might be changing. Um, and we should talk about that, Stephen, But because uh, I do have an opinion on that. But uh, what I want to say about John McCain is this, all right? I'm not a big, I'm not uh, a fan of John McCain. I'm not a supporter of John McCain. His foundation actually employs George Osborne at $150,000 a year, and George Osborne's responsible for literally killing people in the UK with austerity. He's one of the politicians responsible. But I, um, I disagree wholeheartedly with nearly everything that John McCain says on a political level, and 100% of everything he says about economics, it's all wrong. Having said that, John McCain is a human being. And I don't care if he doesn't like me personally because of my politics or because of what I have to say. Um, I don't want to see the man die from this horrific disease. And uh, I do wish him the best. I, I, I seriously do. I, if you want to call me a trickle-down Reagan, I love it or whatever because I said that or a far-right, and be my guest. I'm a fucking socialist, okay? <laughs> I, I just don't like – I don't care who it is. I don't want to see people suffer. All right. And, um, you know, I don't care how wealthy he is or how powerful he is or how stupid he is. No one deserves cancer. No, no one does. But there is an irony here, sir. There is an, there is an irony. I just wanted to make it clear that I'm not going to come out and publicly. Nobody needs to. It's disgusting. Nobody. I, 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 I find it revolting that anybody would. But I will yeah. say this. But, but there is an irony here that whilst he's getting excellent. NHS style healthcare in the US, he's voting against the same for other people. And I know for a fact if this man has a conscience, he knows, he knows this could save his life. He knows that he could die from this. And if it weren't for the healthcare that he's receiving, he would, if he were just an average person on the street, he would be fucked. And he knows this. And to step into Congress on the floor of the Senate and vote, you know, in, in, against the ACA, which is suck anyway, but to vote, 
against the people themselves is just absolutely disgusting. And we all know why he's doing it. He's going to claim the government doesn't have any money, and then he's going to claim that it's un-American for, you know, it's socialist and blah, 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 and we have a free market here, we do the American way, market, 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 fuck America that way. That's not a real view of America. America's never was that way. This is a political choice, not an economic one, all right? There's nothing to do with financial necessity here. So when I say fuck America, I mean fuck these appeals to America. America, America, no, that doesn't count. Not when people are dying, not when people out there on the street who are this far from homelessness because they're in foreclosure right now happen to have brain cancer, okay? When people are dying of diseases that could be prevented, all right? It's this, it's America is not an excuse, okay? It's political bullshit, right? So, all right. Let, let me let me take this next stab here because this is we're 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 up on that time spot. But this ought to take some time to get through. So I, I want to throw this out there. You know, within our within our movement, we have people uh, starting up third parties, uh, starting up parties outside the duopoly, uh, coalition parties uh, like Draft Bernie, uh, Progressive Independent Party. Of course, you have the Greens and you have others. Now I I'm telling you right now that my problem with both orthodox duopoly parties is both of them peddle lies that keep us away from having this incredible, wonderful new deal that we know we can have because we can never run short of pieces of paper. So the issue is not a matter of having currency available to do it. We can do it. The question is, which party is going to have the courage and conviction to stand up for a bold progressive agenda. Not a 40 year plan, but a single one time new deal. Here you go, folks. We're making your life better today. That right there. And I'm telling you right now, I'm looking for these third parties, even though I support them. I am looking for them to stop dibble dabbling around and be bold in their understanding of economics, be bold in their demands of what they want for a new deal, because that's the only way they're offering anything useful. If they are offering a counter narrative to the duopoly party, just being out here and joining hands and uniting together and being friends and having a good campfire song is not an adequate stance to be taken. It's, it requires the substance of economic truth to back up their claims that they are a superior option to the duopoly liars. If they do not offer up that superior option that allows me to save my children, the planet, you know, the environment, give us, get rid of the student debt, you name it, give us a federal job guarantee, then, they're, then they've forsaken a golden opportunity to be that agent of change, to be the one that brings about a labor party, a new deal, et cetera. So they, this is a warning to all up and coming third parties and those who claim to want to build outside the duopoly. If you peddle conspiracies, if you peddle economic small ball, if you allow the current orthodox narrative to go as your own, you have done nothing to change anything. You're just a third party and you're doing nothing. It is incumbent upon you to provide hope and that hope is in producing a robust, unapologetic, progressive agenda. And that means you've got to know MMT. Without it, you're getting nowhere and you're getting nowhere fast. So that's, that's my warning to all third parties coming up out there. I support you in solidarity for the things that we fight for. But the economics must be there or you are just pissing in the wind. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you something else that needs to be the class consciousness. I, we talked about this when I was on vacation. There needs to be a class consciousness. All right, the left, and I've said this for two years now. Class counts. Class matters, and I keep getting this shit from the old left. Class is dead. Class is dead. Identity politics. Identity politics. No, class is not dead. Class counts precisely because neoliberalism is class warfare, all right? It's the capitalist class declaring war on everybody else. 
And until the left drops this fetish with identity politics by taking the working class, and the working class is everybody who is not the capitalist class, all right? I don't care how much your income is. As long as you're working, you're working class. Now, with that being said, we're talking about the 99%, as they call it, okay? So here's the thing. What the left has done over many years now, because of its confusion in economics, it has looked for a political answer to what's been going on. And what it has done is it has taken the entire class, the working class, the 99%, and it has subdivided it ignorantly into little bitty orphanages, okay? Over here you've got the racism thing, and over here you've got uh, uh, the oppressed uh, women, and over here you've got the transgendered issues and, and, and gay lesbian issues, and over here you've got, and they've, what they've done is they've divided one class, one unified class, into a sea of little bitty classes. And, and think, well, we're going to fight these little battles and we're going to win the war. You're not going to win shit. All right? That's what neoliberalism wants. Okay? Disunity. You have to have a consciousness. You have to understand class. You have to get back to class. It has to be unified. We're all in one fucking boat together and it's fucking sinking. And the capitalist is trying to sink it. It's the thing that's sinking. Neoliberalism is class warfare. I'm not going to say it again because it should be clear. And it is waged by the capitalist class and it is using your currency issuing national government to strip you of your birthright. What is your birthright? You were apportioned as a US citizen, as a British citizen, okay, in the UK, same thing. In the US, as a US citizen, you were apportioned a small, uh, sufficient amount of the national prosperity for your very own by birthright because you are a US citizen. It has been stolen from you through class warfare. You will stand up, you will go and claim it. You will not sit there and allow yourself to be drugged through the mud and then demand little bits of crumbs from the capitalist dinner table, which is spilled with your share, he's eating your share and he's using the currency issuing national government as a tool against you. It's your government, okay? Neoliberalism is class warfare. So if these third parties ever want to see any kind of success, they're going to have to say, yes, women are oppressed. Yes, racism is an issue. But ultimately, this is an economic battle. And to fix society, we're going to have to win the economics. We have to reunite as a class that is oppressed. All of us together are in the same goddamn boat, all right? And if you do that, if you adopt all of the things that are as a package deal that the old left holds dear into one package with MMT at the core, neoliberalism will not survive. As an international movement, it will not survive. You will have fangs larger than and sharper than a saber-toothed tiger, and you will be able to sink them into the neck of neoliberalism and bleed the beast out until it is dead. Beyond that, if you do not understand unity, if you do not understand MMT, and you do not you you do not employ what it implies, you will go nowhere. You need to drop this fetish with identity politics and these little oh well this is my pet issue and this is my pet issue and this is my pet issue and then go into your little orphanages. You, you, you need to drop it. You need to come out of the orphanages and you need to get with your brothers and sisters because we're all oppressed. Yes, some more than others socially, but we're all oppressed, all right? And this is an economic thing, okay? Neoliberalism is an economic war machine. It does not give a shit about your rights. It does not give a shit what color you are. It doesn't give a shit if you're gay or lesbian or transgender. It doesn't give a shit if you're Asian. It doesn't give a shit if you like chocolate pie or chocolate mousse or if you prefer vanilla ice cream for dessert. It doesn't give a fuck about you. It just wants your share of your birthright. It wants it all for itself and it wants you to beg at its feet. And it is using the federal government 
as a weapon against you. Understand? Politicians in Congress are the problem. The Federal Reserve is not the problem. The EPA is not the problem. The capitalist himself is not the fucking problem because the capitalist needs Congress in order to take power over you. And that is precisely how the capitalist has taken power over you. This is precisely how Wall Street has taken power over you. They have friends in Congress. The idea then is to get rid of Congress, to unseat every son of a bitch that sits in Congress, all 535, and replace them with people who are willing to be conscious of the public purpose, willing to be conscious of prosperity for all is the most important thing, and willing to understand completely that the federal government must deficit spend for full employment and the public purpose in perpetuity. That's it. Congress is the problem. But what does that mean, Stephen? It means that we are the problem. Ultimately, it is our problem because we have created this mess. All right? If you voted, you created this mess. We have created this mess together. We must acknowledge that we have created this mess. And then we must undo this fucking mess. Let, let, me, let me interject, Alice, because here's where the... Uh... The movement will speak out because we've seen in our elections, we've seen the Democratic primaries mm -hmm. rigged. Uh, yeah, we've yeah. seen that uh, the way that the electioneers hold the polling places and they shut down, make it impossible to vote. We've mm -hmm. seen how they lose votes, how they lose uh, flip votes, how they do these things. The, electrics, the electronic voting systems are hackable, this, that, and the other. There's no confidence in them. So here's what I want to make sure so we don't get sidelined again with yet another diversion. It doesn't matter or not, these elections are rigged. We have to change that. So I don't want you to take what I'm saying the wrong way. What I am saying is this. If we get folks, enough folks, we don't need everybody, but we need enough to stand up and rise up for economic justice mm -hmm. and be unapologetic, in our understanding that we can do this, the rest will fall in line and they will bend the knee. They will acquiesce to our demands. They will or they'll be thrown out. Well, but my They're point, regardless of all that, the point is that people sideline themselves. Right. With this concept that we can't vote our way out of it. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Woe is me. Oh, no. And this is literally the shit that we get. We're trying to teach an economic message. Some jackwad will go ahead and throw up some completely non sequitur comment that has nothing to do with what we're saying. And they're so ready to throw in the towel. It's all hopeless. We're all going to die. Mm -hmm. and this is yet again another progressive give up strategy. That's horseshit. It's all horseshit. It's absolutely insane. So anyway. Look, look, look over to UK. The elections are rigged everywhere. Why do you think they're rigged? Because 40 years of you guys voting for rigged elections. Right? Now it's entrenched. Okay? Look at, look at the UK. Looks like it didn't help much with Theresa May, did it? Labour took 30 seats. We do the same goddamn thing here. And if they rig it to the point where it ends up with a, where an actual general election or a congressional election ends up just like the Bernie thing that happened in the Democratic primary, <laughs> you get enough people pissed off. I would just like for you to imagine about just 10 million Americans pissed off and marching on Washington. It's not, not going to happen. They're not going to turn the U.S. military on you. That's cost, that's, that's posse comitatus. It's not going to happen. I don't think they have the guts to do that yet. <laughs> All right. We're going to – it's just it's just a distraction. It's just another way to distract from reality, they don't. I don't want to hear about MMT. I want to stay in my comfort zone and be dramatic. I like my drama, Stan. Don't interfere with my drama. You know, that's all it is. You've got to have some drama. Well, fuck your drama. People are dying. We, we, we had another one. This is one of my favorite ones here recently. That There's only like, what, a couple MMTers out there in the world? So how are we going to do this? <laughs> Couple, oh, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> called Jeremy Corbyn up. 
get him on the phone privately, say, you ever heard of MMT? He's going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one in Australia has heard of MMT yet. No one. No one in the U.S. has. It's just a couple of people in New York City. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absurd. That's absurd. Oh, my God. A couple of it, just a couple. Okay, that's just fantastic. <laughs> you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. There's no question about it. So, all right. How about, well, how about that? How about that uh, Chuck Schumer deal about calling for progressives to come and listen? The Democratic Party might be willing to change its mind. <laughs> well, they called on Stephanie Kelton. They yeah. they got her in there. Yeah. And to be fair, let's be fair for a moment. They are probably finding a way to co-opt language to repackage neoliberalism to look progressive because they are 100% neoliberal. And at the same time, though, they are also 100% political animals, which means that they want to survive. And if the, the climate says that they have to adopt what we're talking about, what Stephanie Kelton is talking about, then they will do exactly that. But as you can clearly see, our third party movements are full of end the feds. They are third party movements are full of people that sideline the movement with identity politics. Mm -hmm. Our third party movements are full of people that have bought into every form of conspiracy under the sun. And the duopoly is doing nothing whatsoever to even change the narrative. It's just, hey, they're Republican or, hey, you're a Democrat. And that's all they say. They don't say anything of substance beyond that. So if the third parties are busy peddling conspiracies and the duopoly is just throwing fecal matter at each other, <laughs> it's going to require some grownups to step up and force this issue. It is. We're going to need some people to mean it and really, really mean it. Hope should be the easy part of this. We should be grabbing hope by the short hairs and saying, you're mine. But instead, they're sidelining us. Even our third, I mean, I'm watching this nonsense go on constantly. And it's like, wow, I, I just mind blown at the opportunities these people are throwing in the garbage so that they can appeal to identity politics. It is ruinous to our movement. I would say on, on a final note, I would say if you want this to be, if you're getting ready to close, then I, I can make this my closing yes. uh, statement. Okay. This is my closing statement. Uh, FDR did some beautiful things. All right. And uh, at the same time, the Democratic Party itself, by appealing to the left, we talked about this a couple Sundays ago, um, that the uh, Democratic Party effectively undermined the left. Uh, by absorbing it and assimilating it, okay? So keep in mind that if, if the Democratic Party comes forward with that after all this and says, okay, we're going to go ahead with universal health care, it might be a watered-down version, you know, you never know. But they're trying to get the left support. They're trying to get the progressive support so they can win an election. Now, uh, they might, in fact, win and then give you universal health care, but I also want you to be caught a uh, uh, I want you to be aware that it will also undermine the left as a movement because it will be assimilated in the, into the Democratic Party. And I'll say, well, the Democratic Party gave us universal health care, so let's just go that way. And it's going to split the left. It will undermine it. And then once again, a true Labour Party, a true left-wing third party creating, not a duopoly, you know, destroying the duopoly and creating a three-party system will all be gone yet again. I'm not saying that that was FDR's intent. FDR wanted to achieve certain things during the Depression, you know, and you need left support for what he wanted to achieve. And it makes perfect sense. But at the same time, the Democratic Party, by absorbing labor and farmers, uh, it did undermine the left. Whereas in Canada, uh, both of the major parties, the ruling parties, ignored labor and farmers, and they ended up getting an effective Labour Party like that in the UK or up in Canada. So there's representation as a third party for, like, for you know, the worker and whatnot. But that's why in the US it might be that 
the left is non-existent as far as a party. Um, and so once again, if they attempt this maneuver, they might even give you a watered down version. And in the end, what you have to exchange that for is the ability of the left to unify as a third party. So you have to be careful. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't trust the Democratic Party until I see it in fine fucking print. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, oh, I do. And even if the Democratic Party is the party that gives you universal health care, let us celebrate and say, hey, that was awesome, but still, fuck you. <laughs> All right. I just don't give a shit. Yes, I'll vote for it. I'll vote for a Democrat who's going to bring us universal health care. no problem. But that doesn't make me a fucking Democrat. I'm still all for a Labour Party. I'm all for a left wing fucking third party. And we're going to go that way so that we can ensure that your birthright that was apportioned to you can be realized, that you can go claim it. And that's it. Yep. And, and so my, my, uh, my comment to our third parties, you know, as, as my final appeal, if you will, to our friends and so forth, is that they must embrace macroeconomic truth. They must embrace this or there is no point. They, they can save their families a lot of time away from each other. They can save themselves a lot of time having to binge watch Game of Thrones. They can watch it in real time. They can save themselves a lot of time, uh, you know, missing good meals together and, and playing in the yard, doing all this organizing and stuff. If they're not going to embrace macroeconomic reality, none of the things that they can, they want to do or say they'll do or can do will ever happen. I mean, this is your charge, folks. If you don't embrace this, then you will be no different than the duopoly. And the only thing is you're sidelining. There's no point in doing a third party if you don't embrace something that is bold and brave and can bring about life change and the end of neoliberalism, otherwise you're just pretending. That's my take on it, Ellis. Yep, that's it. It's just a game of pretense. You can't do anything. You can say, I'm going to tax the rich to pay for universal health care. Well, how much is universal health care? Well, we imagine it's going to be $1 trillion this year. Okay, well, we'll tax the rich $1 trillion and then we'll pay for it. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense because, as we explained in the beginning, it can't work because it's operationally impossible. <laughs> so That's right. It's just dumb. You know, we could just get to work now. I've told people this a million times, and I'm going to say it for a million and one time, and I've said it on this show numerous times. If the president signed a job guarantee into law today, we could have it completely up and running, functioning, and filled to the hilt with full employment on the way in 12 months a job guarantee office in every community. And we would abolish and abolish our unemployment like that. You don't have to wait to tax the rich to do it. <laughs> we can get this shit done now. Get it done now. Okay? And then tax the rich at an extremely high rate. That people will say, I want to hear an MMT or say tax the rich. Okay, you're about to hear it right now from me. I believe the rich should be taxed, and I'm talking about the extremely wealthy. We all know who we're talking about when we say the rich. The rich should be taxed at a rate of about 80%, maybe even a little bit more. Okay? And the reason why is because they're too fucking rich. Not to fund spending, not to pay for universal health care, not to pay for a Moab bomb, not to pay for infrastructure repair but because they're too goddamn rich and it's dangerous. That's simple. So yes, I'm an MMT and I say with great clarity in an American accent, tax the rich at 80% to reduce their wealth built up in terms of US dollars because they're too fucking rich. Yeah. Happy now? There we <laughs> I mean, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Ellis, with that, I want to thank you for making time on a Tuesday night. No, thank you for having me. Well, oh, dude, you're my hero, man. We, I, I love our time together, so I appreciate it. Look forward to uh, Sunday. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and leave up the fear as a liar. 
You guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And remember, you see folks sidelining you, educate them. If they're not educated, leave them, abandon them, move on, and focus where people are willing to make a change because that is what it's going to take for us to make progress. With that, thank you all so much. Have a great night. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.